Rabbi Dr. Josh Feigelson is Executive Director at the Institute for Jewish Spirituality and former Dean of Students at Chicago Divinity School. Josh was named Executive Director of IJS in January of 2020. He received ordination from Yeshivat Chobabe Torah Rabbinical School in 2005 and served for six years as the Hill Rabbi at Northwestern, where he also earned a PhD in Religious Studies. In 2011, Josh helped found and serve as Executive Director of Ask Big Questions, an initiative of Hillel International. Josh is a Wexner Graduate Fellow and was the founding co-chair of the Wexner Fellowship Alumni Committee. Maggie Siddiqui is the Director of Faith and Public Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Her role is focused on advancing a progressive vision of faith and religious liberty and engaging a network of faith leaders. Maggie previously served as the Director of Communications and Strategic Initiatives for the El Hibri Foundation, a philanthropic organization advancing inclusion of and within Muslim, Jew Muslim American communities. And she served as program, she also served as program coordinator at the Islamic Society of North America's Office for Interfaith and Community Alliances in Washington, DC, where she oversaw implementation of interfaith dialogue and community outreach programs and conducted outreach to government officials and stakeholders on issues of social justice. Please feel free to send in your questions in real time using the Q&A box on your screens, and we'll take some time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ari Gordon, AJC Director of U.S. Muslim Jewish Relations to moderate our conversation. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, thanks to our panelists and to our watching audience. Uh, for those who are still celebrating Eid Mubarak, to those looking forward to the holiday of Shavuot, Chag Sameach or Hajj Sameach, as we might say. Um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating moment to be having this conversation, looking at medium and long-term impacts of the pandemic on our communities and the relations between us. It's a platitude at this point to say that we have been uh, monumentally affected, that religion has been uh, impacted by the pandemic. We are past Passover, Easter, Ramadan. Uh, but just a moment, I'm carrying with me, and I will forever, a picture of the empty St. Peter's Square as the Pope offered mass, uh, checking in on the Western Wall camera, the Kotel cam, seeing an empty plaza, the Kaaba completely empty of pilgrims. It is stark and it is striking. And we have the opportunity today as we are looking at what stage one of opening up our communities will look like, as we think about what the new normal, as people are saying, uh, will be, if there ever should be one, we have a privilege of doing this conversation with Muslims and Jews together. AJC is committed to the work of Muslim Jewish relations as the dominant challenge in interreligious affairs in the 21st century, and we're looking for nothing short of a transformation. It's a delight to be having this conversation on the ACCESS platform because ACCESS is really a forerunner in this work for AJC and for the Jewish people. It's probably not a stretch to say that without the good work of young leadership coming together as Muslims and Jews, we wouldn't be here having a, a department or a sub-department in Muslim Jewish relations. We're based on the principle, not that every issue needs to, needs to be on the table that divides us. We, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, is important to Muslims and Jews. Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, as we discuss them, all of the difficult conversations are part of our relations. But of course, we send a strong message when we show that we can work together and talk about disagreements, but make progress on issues that, uh, that unite us. And this is the premise of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, that Chelsea is a member of our New York region. There are 11 regions and a national council advocating together against hate crimes and promoting the place of Muslims and Jews as essential threads in the fabric of American society. And it's in that spirit that we come together today with two incredible thinkers. You heard their bios, Maggie and Josh. You both have experience within your communities and central institutions of Muslim and Jewish communities in America, but you both also have experience in institutions that are outward looking. It's a pleasure to have you, and uh, I'm excited for our audience and for myself to get to learn from you about our topics today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us, Ari. Yeah. So let's dive in. Josh, you've seen campus communities, both Jewish 
at Northwestern and as a dean at, Har at uh, Chicago Divinity School. You have been on campus with ask, ask Big Questions, and now you're looking at Jewish spirituality and what, we, what, we, what that looks like in this country. How are our communities uh, experiencing what community looks like now? And, and in the medium and long term, as we go online, is, are there long term impacts of the pandemic? Is social distancing uh, going to shape us going forward? What does it mean for the idea of community, for the experience of individuals? Get us started. Um. Great, you're starting with the small questions, so um, we're, we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Um, you know, obviously, you know, it, it's um, we're, we're not going to know uh, we're, we're not going to know what's what until we can look in the rearview mirror. Um, what, but, but what I'll say is, I I see right now. Um, I think what a lot of people have. Uh, others have noticed and what we certainly heard from you know the many clergy and others who we work with um that uh there is of course like a, a a profound shift taking place in terms of the availability of stuff online and what community you know really means um that community that there's been beautiful you know memes that are going around about like you know I don't need to open my synagogue or my mosque or my church because um, that's not what it's about. Like we're, we've been open the whole time. The community is here and the relationships are here. Um, and like I opened my email this morning and saw that like my Jewish learning is running a Tikkun Leil Shavuot. They're running their own, you know, the, the custom is on Thursday night this, you know, this week when we celebrate Shavuot that you would run normally in your local synagogue or someplace, you would run a an all night or an evening sort of session of studying Torah and different people would be teaching everything. And my Jewish learning, which is not like a, you know, known as a community provider in that way, they're, they're, they're a media company um, and a media outlet, they're running their own tikkun, as it were, with people who are all over the country offering wonderful things to teach. Um, and so I was like, wow, that's a really interesting reconfiguration. And I'm seeing that all over the place now where like, you know, if you have a Zoom account and you have good people, you can wind up, you know, offering content. It doesn't matter where you're from, um, where you're broadcasting from. So uh, there, there, I think that that is a coming into, we'll see what that, what that winds up being. I, you know, I find in our work, um, uh, particularly at, at IJS, I think that one of the, the, the real questions that a lot of people are, that I've, I've been wrestling with and I've heard people um, wrestling with uh, since this all began is when you strip away all of the social performance elements of religious life um, and showing up to shul, you know, to be seen um, and to experience being seen. And even when you think you're a really like advanced person, I'm not showing up to be seen. I'm just here to do my spiritual work. It turns out you really were like performing because there's no, you know, it's it's the observ the, the observation, the principle of observation, like, you know, the, you, you, you'll wind up being um, uh, you, you'll wind up being changed by the fact of being in that group. So when you strip all that away, we had this at the very beginning with with Passover was what's left, right? Um, if if it's not about that, um, if it's not about showing up and being seen in community, what's left? And and I think for a lot of people, that's a real profound spiritual crisis. Um, it's provoked some real questions of. Um, well, what is this really all for? What's most important to me? Um, and for some people, it's led them into deeper spiritual practice. For other people, um, I think it's become more attenuated. So I think there's a real reconfiguration going on. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'll say, at the, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sure that when we get back to being able to meet in community, there is such a desire for, we, we're all like really hungry for physical proximity, for touch, for smell, for the rest of our senses than just sight and sound. Um, and so I'm sure that there's gonna be you know, a, a role for that, but we are clearly experiencing, um, I think a real reconfiguration of what community could mean. And I think the jury, the jury is very much out um, at the moment, but I think to me anyway, part of the answer is gonna revolve around, we're gonna need to rediscover what is really spiritual practice and religious practice that answers fundamental needs and questions that people have. It's not enough simply to do the stuff we did because we always did it. Um, it's got to actually um, help answer uh, the, the, the real questions that are on people's minds. Mm. So we've been forced to stop and take a breath as it were. 
and it think were. what's really essential about community. And we're left with the question, Maggie, what, what are you seeing in uh, the Muslim community spaces and other religious spaces that you're in touch with on this question? How's, how's community changing? Is it, are the changes gonna last? Um, what's gonna be different? What's gonna be the same as we go back? Um, well, thanks, first of all, Ari, for having me for um, such a, a rich conversation. I absolutely agree um, with Josh about a number of those points. I mean, just the concept of who is in the sort of zone of your community to begin with. Um, like who is in your zone of care, right? Like it, it's not necessarily the people um, within your local community that um, uh, that you're necessarily gathering with spiritually nowadays or uh, checking in on. I've been having, I had check-ins throughout Ramadan in terms of like my, our spiritual state with friends in Chicago, Tulsa and Charlottesville, <laughs> um, whereas I live in DC. Um, and I think in a spiritual sense, um, it is really fascinating as well. As Islamically, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, physical presence. Um, there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that where two or more are gathered in the remembrance of God, the angels gather also. And it's sort of a terrifying concept. If we can't gather, if we can't physically gather, are the angels going to come? Are we going to feel um, the presence of God? And I. I have felt that that, um, you know, if we worship a transcendent God who is not bound by time or space, um, that that physical presence is not required of God, um, that God can transcend that. And so that's been an important um, lesson, I think, for me to learn and, and I think for others as well, that there is a way to experience the presence of God through a Zoom webinar, <laughs> um, through kind of this online um, um, community. And that's been really, really uh, powerful and transformative. I mean, we're just coming out of the month of Ramadan, a time which is very intensely in-person, physical, breaking fast together, praying um, for hours um, together at night and uh, having to shift how we do that. Um, to spend more time individually in, 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 uh, with God and then also um, being connected to each other, you know, online, <laughs> um, I, I think has been really, has been really spiritually transformational, I think, for, um, for a lot of folks. Um, and it's been really exciting to witness also kind of what other uh, faith communities are doing um, within their communities and how they are being so creative um, adapting to this time. I mean, I don't, I, so I moderate a, uh, uh, I'm one of several moderators of a Facebook group of over 7,000 uh, faith leaders who are sharing all of the ways that they've adapted during this time. And as Josh said, you know, the, the houses of worship may be closed, but they're very much, uh, like the buildings might, may be closed, but the, uh, the communities are very, very much open um, these faith leaders are doing, you know, 10 times what they were doing before the pandemic. Um, you know, they're doing like uh, bedtime Bible stories for the children, which is at an hour that would not have been feasible if it were at church, you know, um, distributing food in, you know, in accordance with public health guidelines as communities are increasingly food insecure. Um, uh, really, really adapting in a number of ways that I think are going to be transformative in terms of um, what we see the role of faith communities and faith leaders to be after the pandemic. Yeah, it's it's a real it's really interesting to think about a shift from uh, brick and mortar buildings to the people who serve in them, and and maybe even creating opportunities for those that aren't connected. To, to actual physical spaces, um, as you were saying, Josh. Yeah, and, and I think I think Ari, you know, it, when you say the brick and mortar buildings, I, you know, when we think about like the role that institutions overall play, and like we're living in this time of like even before COVID, where institutions were coming under just increasing stress and fragmentation, and now we're seeing like we have these fundamental institutions that are really like renewing themselves in a certain way. It's like, well, if you took away all the brick and mortar, which is basically a repository 
of all this other energy. It's like, well, there's all this other work that that, that does for you. And now you have to go create that for yourself, right? Um, you actually have to invest the energy into it. And so, you know, my clergy colleagues, um, you know, Maggie, is, you know, you're, you're reporting, this is across the board. They all re the report that they are working so much harder. Why? Because the work that their buildings used to do for them, right, they now have to like take on themselves and it's sort of like injecting all of that energy into a system. And, um, and, and, and it's going to be really fascinating to see like what comes of that then when um, we can ease some of that pressure and use the buildings that we have. Are we going to go back to the ways that we used to do things or is this going to lead to higher levels of sort of engagement and sort of renewed, more energized uh, communities? Like I, I think that that could be a really exciting um, and, and optimistic sort of take on what could come from, come from this and you know, in, in the way that a forest fire after the fire, there is all of this richness in the soil that then, you know, new stuff is going to grow. So we can hope. Yeah, and happening at a really interesting moment, uh, you know, if I had a nickel every time someone said, can you imagine what this was like in 1918, before we had the technological capabilities of connecting, the fact that the pot has been stirred so dramatically at a time when we have such new capabilities that people get to play and experiment with, is really um, promising in some ways for what we might get to see. And maybe in the Q&A, we'll, some of people will provoke us to keep digging deeper on that question. I wanna take us um, from turning inward to community to turning outward towards our place as faith communities in the US landscape. Um, Muslims and Jews are both very active in American civic and political engagement. Um, the perception of Muslims and Jews uh, is also really politicized and really hot these days, including prejudice, bigotry, hateful rhetoric, um, and even violence against our communities. People know this and people see this. The, we've already seen that the pressures of the pandemic, including loss of life and livelihood that give way to fear and anger, um, easily pressurize people to, to turn inward rather than outward the lines between us sometimes get emphasized and it can be difficult to know how do we respond? How have we as faith communities in the public square changed through this? Is our mission any different? At AJC, we partnered with ISNA for, to found the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council because we wanted to be a joint voice out there, knowing that um, bigotry against Jews, against Muslims, is problematic for Americans generally. It's not just a Jewish issue. It's not just a Muslim issue. Of course, we need to look out for ourselves, but it's bad for America. I wonder, Maggie, from where you sit, um, has the way we do business as faith-based activists, faith-based advocates shifted at all? Um, we're entering a 2020 election campaign these cycles generally are not great for religious minorities like Muslims and Jews. What are you seeing and what can you tell us uh, about what to expect going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, as you noted, we were already kind of in a, in a difficult situation. Um, election cycles do tend to um, bring out uh, a lot of kind of bigotry and scapegoating and um, wedge attacks between communities and that kind of thing. And then we've had this added layer of um, the pandemic and um, the white supremacy that we've seen arising specifically tied to that. Um, so my team at the Center for American Progress has been focused a lot on analysis of uh, religious freedom and the way that that has been politicized and um, weaponized during the pandemic. We've seen um, protests and lawsuits against stay-at-home orders that have alleged that. Um, and, and it's only um, religious freedom for a certain group of people. Um, so we found that those who are advancing this narrative of you know, the stay-at-home orders are violating my religious freedom are the same conservative groups who have use this as a free pass to override other government regulation. Um, they used religious freedom to justify slavery, um, to say it was the right to do that, the religious right to do that, religious right to segregate. Um, 
They've used it to justify discrimination against LGBTQ people much more recently to deny contraceptive care, to deny Jews and Catholics the ability to become uh, foster parents. Um, and it's part of this larger white supremacist anti-government agenda. Um, it, it's this, this um, you know, to be able to kind of have this free pass to override government regulation. And um, to explain why I think this is connected here, so Newsweek a few, day, a few days ago reported that half of people in England, okay, half of all people in England believe in a coronavirus related conspiracy theory. 20% specifically believe that the pandemic was perpetrated by Jews. And 20%, I'm not sure if it's the same 20%, believe that Muslims are intentionally spreading the coronavirus in the West. Um, and we've seen at these same protests that are alleging this like religious freedom claim and all of this, the same protests to stay at home orders, we're seeing the use of Nazi slogans um, in different states here in the US. Um, but the same sort of scapegoating um, advancement of conspiracy theories, all of that, that further drives hate. Um, just before Ramadan, the president himself retweeted the conspiracy theory that stay-at-home orders wouldn't be enforced in mosques, but they had been enforced in churches and said that mosques are being treated better than churches, which I can tell you is um, factually incorrect um, in terms of the experience of Muslims in this country. Um, but I think that this is, uh, as terrifying as all of this is, it is also an opportunity for Jews and Muslims to come together in new ways um, to, uh, you know, with other communities to push back against um, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and the white supremacy that, that undergirds these, um, and to um, form, you know, form new relationships and, you know, just as we're forming new, new types of community within our own communities to form new types of interfaith community as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maggie. It's, it's interesting to see the connection between different forms of hatred. Of course, AJC is a 501c3. We don't support or advocate uh, for any particular party. Um, MJAC and AJC was instrumental in pushing Congress in bipartisan ways to hold hearings to assess the threat of white supremacist ideology for the country. And in fact, this has led to greater oversight and resources to law enforcement to do so. And we hope that that will, that that will continue. It's really interesting to hear how some of the protests that you're seeing out there connect to other trends that we're seeing as well. Um, Josh, you've done a lot of thinking about publics and public life as well. Are, are you seeing any shifts fundamentally about the way Jews do business in public these days? Um, you know, I think it's interesting that, that one, one of the things that, that I, I've, I've noticed, and I'm not the only person who's noticed this, I think that um, it's really striking that whereas um, a lot of the Orthodox community in, and especially the modern Orthodox community that I, I have some roots in, um, in, in the Jewish community in America over the last, you know, uh, decades has become more and more um, politically affiliated with um, uh, with the Republican Party, um, both you know for socioeconomic and and Israel related reasons, et cetera. It's sort of tracked with that. In this case, um, the Orthodox community is overwhelmingly on the side of science and and you know and is following public health regulations, right? And so, um, with the exception of some outlier cases that you know Mayor De Blasio in in New York and here in West Rogers Park in Chicago, but overall. Um, uh, even not just the modern Orthodox community, but the Haredi community, the, you know, the, the ultra Orthodox community have been, I mean, uh, have been um, vocal in putting out statements, rabbinic leadership has been vocal in putting out statements of even if, you know, public health regulations would allow us to, 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 ho to hold uh, prayer services, we're going to wait you know, until later. We want to wait, you know, a good couple of weeks afterwards to make sure because we take the mandate of, uh, of, of pikuach nefesh, of saving life, um, mo that, that's the most serious imperative we have in Jewish law. And I think there is, there, there's, there's an interesting sort of point of connection here in the Jewish and, and Muslim communities of both I think a, a, a real appreciation of both science and a legalistic way of thinking um, that though, 
my, my, my guess is that the sort of, um, uh, the rejection of science and the, and, and the uh, questioning of, of scientific expertise is not so much a problem, right, in, in, in our communities. In fact, if anything, the, the, the vast majorities are like on the side of science and scientific experts and medicine um, and public health. And I do think it ties then into what Maggie's talking about in terms of the white supremacy issue, that part of what's built into that rhetoric is, uh, is a rhetoric that questions science, at least science that's not convenient for, you know, my sense of uh, personal liberty. Um, and I think we have a lot in common. Uh, to, we have a lot of shared vocabulary or shared ethic around notions of collective responsibility, personal responsibility, and towards the collective. Um, so I wonder if there's, you know, th th there is a, a reconfiguration here, you know, just I notice in the Jewish community of, there is this break where, where I, would, I would have expected, you know, if things had followed the patterns that they followed, more of the Orthodox community to sort of be parroting some of these lines in some of the more politically right circles that are questioning public health guidelines. And in fact, I've seen just the opposite. So um, I, I think that that's a really interesting thing to sort of take note of and take stock of. And I'll be, I'll, I'll be curious to see how that plays out over the course of the, you know, the election campaign um, that's coming. Hmm. It, it is very interesting to think that our trust in democratic institutions and in scientific institutions could have a deep impact on the way that we see ourselves as members of a broader American electorate and that that might have political implications for the parties we want to join. Again, AJC is a 501c3, so I'm not advocating for either party, but the point that you bring up is, is really worth sitting with. And it's interesting you talked about shifts that happen over time. Um, we've met with and spoken with analysts on AJC's um, leadership missions in Muslim Jewish relations where we're bringing national Jewish leaders into conversation with counterparts in the Muslim community. Something they've told us has also been about shifts in, in party affiliation over the years. And noting the similarity between the communities takes me to uh, the third area of conversation I want us to have relations between our communities. I think there are a lot of people that are, are interested to hear what is it we can do if we wanted to build bridges in a time where there's social distancing. Can social cohesion between Muslims and Jews exist where there's social distancing? AJC is very committed to this, but a lot of the work we do is uh, in-person meetings, is international uh, missions. We do a lot of work in Muslim-majority countries in Jordan, in Egypt, Morocco, the UAE, Indonesia, um, and even with all the different faith communities in India and elsewhere. Uh, in January, we took a multinational uh, delegation, partnered with the Muslim World League, and AJC led this trip to Auschwitz and to Warsaw to look at Jewish life. There were um, delegates from Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc., Tunisia, all of that stuff can't happen. Even here in the United States, we know that as we make progress, so much of what we're asking of people is to take a step outside of their comfort zone and into someone else's or into a shared space. Uh, before the shutdown, I, th I would say we were seeing a beautiful flourishing and a laboratory moment of Muslim Jewish relations. Dialogue groups, cultural exchanges, education programs, even programs like advocacy and activism and shared solidarity. But a lot of it is premised on the idea that we could be in the room together, um, build trust to take a social risk, have difficult conversations while we're sitting across the table from one another. It's not clear that we can do that now. So my question to you, and perhaps Josh will start with you, is what are we to do now that we can't sit down face to face? What are we to do now that our ability to work across physical lines is, um, is challenged in this way? And have you seen any new opportunities open up that weren't there before on the flip side of that question? Um, I mean, I think, you know, look, the person who can figure out um, how to form new cohorts and generate trust where it didn't exist before via Zoom 
um, that person will get a Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> then that's like the million dollar question right now for a lot of us. Um, but um, I, I do think, um, I think that there are some opportunities. I think that, um, it, particularly in terms of learning, right? I think that we have what, what though a lot of us are working harder, it seems like we also have we also have a different kind of control of our time now, um, where we're not, you know, running around from place to place. Like we we we've taken transportation time out, right? And when you take transportation time out uh, of your life, by and large, um, there's a whole lot of found time all of a sudden, right? Um, uh, those of us with kids at home or other dependents, uh, that time gets filled up, of course, with with other things. But I think that there is an opportunity, like certainly we're seeing uh, at IJS, of this is a time where people do have more time and, 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 and ability to do personal learning and personal introspection, first of all. And so potentially to be doing some more serious reflection on what are my own, what's, what are my, the, own gap, the gaps in my own knowledge um, about my tradition, about the other tradition, another tradition, um, how might I learn those things? It would be really interesting, you know, uh, to offer an intro to Judaism course for Muslims and an intro to Islam course for Jews. Um, and to do that, you know, that could actually be a wonderful opportunity, which I don't think we would normally, we would normally think about, like, we need to have cultural exchanges. Well, we can't really do the cultural exchanges now. So fine, let's focus on like the knowledge stuff that might actually not be such a bad idea. Um, as well as uh, a little bit more personal reflection of um, uh, what are my own biases, and you know, do I, you know, are, are there are there places where my lack of knowledge or my lack of relationship potentially can I be more sensitive to where I have cultural biases that um, I should be trying to interrogate more? I think I think this. You know, we've been talking at IJS about this time being um, a time of sabbatical, a time of like it's 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 a time of shmita. Uh, that in the Torah, you know, every seven years we let the land uh, lie fat, the land of Israel, and we don't we don't plow it and we don't you know harvest it. Um, and uh, and so this is a time of that quiet. It's like all of this economic activity has ceased, and in that year, it's really meant to be a year of uh, of, of looking inward. Um, and of trying to go deeper. And in the, sometimes the road to going out is through going in. Um, so I wonder, about, you know, that, that might be an opportunity uh, of this time. Hmm. It's really interesting to think, about, uh, to think about this time for pause and that we then might be able to do learning even if it's in our own space. Maggie, you know, our friendship is a Muslim Jewish friendship and goes back years we know each other, I can pick up the phone and call you and we can have difficult conversations and we can have the kinds of uh, trust building conversations that are just about life. But what do you recommend for people who don't already know, uh, know people along those other lines? Or for those that do, what, what can you tell our audience if they wanna go out there and do some of the good work of interfaith and Muslim Jewish bridge building? Well, I think I might be a little bit more optimistic about the ability to build trust um, online. I, I, just as I doubted the ability to engage in authentic spiritual community online um, during, you know, especially during Ramadan um, with my fellow Muslims, I feel like um, there is an ability to transcend that physical gap in interfaith relationships as well, even new ones. Um, and that perhaps we're not giving ourselves enough credit. At least we have to try. Um, I also think interfaith work, you know, as you said, you know, there are international missions and all of that. I think a lot of it tends to be, you know, hyper local. And, um, you know, just as uh, folks have been streaming services from all over the country or all over the world, what does it look like to kind of expand our sense of interfaith community? Um, our communities are not always concentrated in the same parts of this country, for example. Um, and what would it look like to be able to, um, you know, form bonds with Muslims and Jews who maybe don't have those kinds of interfaith opportunities in their communities and might be really hungry for that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there, there's an opportunity to do kind of more, programming in that area. And um, 
I love what you said, Josh, about this notion of like, you know, also taking the time for more personal reflection, um, interrogating our own biases. And I think, you know, I would add to that, that in this um, political climate, what we're seeing are, we, we've been seeing this, but just, we see a lot of wedge attacks, uh, you know, to divide uh, Muslims and Jews. Um, I know you're 5 one three. I would just add that, you know, the, the <laughs> You know, the, when the president made the comment about mosques perhaps being treated better than churches, he also added in this bizarre reference that was completely out of place uh, to um, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and her stance on Israel, which it, it like made no sense in the context of that conversation, but I felt was a way of signaling to Jews and Christians who might have come to the defense of Muslims in that conversation that maybe you don't want to come to defense uh, to the defense of Muslims, um, to really try and drive that wedge. And um, I think this is an opportunity to kind of sit back and note, you know, what's going on here and how are we going to um, make sure our relationships can um, survive those attacks and we can, and we can work united uh, to, to counter the, the violent white supremacy we're seeing. Yeah, we, we definitely know that there's a politicization of our identities out there uh, and it happens on the right and it happens on the left. And we, as Muslims and Jews, get painted and instrumentalized in, in a lot of these different ways. It's interesting that what you said before about opening up new opportunities, usually during Ramadan, I'm jumping to four or five different iftars, but they're all around the New York City or tri-state area. This year, um, so many of our AJC and MJAC offices regionally did Muslim Jewish iftars. Um, I got to go to Dallas and Los Angeles and Philadelphia and DC and on and Miami and on and on. Uh, and there are certain opportunities that are opened up by the current moment. Um, I think, you know, we, we certainly promised to have some space. I could keep talking to you and probably will. We can continue after this webinar is over. But um, I know we have some questions and maybe Chelsea, will you uh, get us started with the first one? Yes, absolutely. Thank you both so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A box below. Uh, Josh, I, I was struck by what you said about how this time is forcing us to strip away some of the, the social and performative aspects of religious life, precisely because so much of both Islam and Judaism is in the performative. And I mean that in the sort of academic sense of the performative, that our, our practice and our actions are how our religious life is embodied. And I'm curious if either of you could share some practical advice for how we can bring that, that active embodiment of our religious life, not just internally, but how we can use it to bridge these divides in the now, perhaps a specific example. Josh, I know you have a, an education background and Maggie, you're in policy. So I think some, some sort of on the nose tips would be helpful to a lot of our audience. Hmm. I mean, I think, <laughs> for bridging the divide, that's a really good question. I mean, um, my, my overall orientation towards, um, you know, towards interfaith work um, is to try to find the questions that we share. Uh, and and not, so not to necessarily ask questions about like, well, what do you believe and what do you believe and what do you do and what do you do? And, and, and just to sort of, you know, share information, um, but really to get to like, there are some common questions that, you know, um, major religious traditions uh, that are that are many centuries and millennia old, um, they share and they're and they're and they're very rich explorations of, and so you know um, how do we rest and where do we feel at home and how do we welcome guests and um, and things like that and so so I think that um, there's an opportunity there to uh, you know Abraham Joshua Heschel has a, has a quote in one of his well he, I think he uses it in virtually all of his books um, that. Uh, the crisis of religion is when um, we, we, we forget the questions that religion is an answer to. Uh, and that in recovering the questions, right, um, then that's when it comes alive. So the performativity, uh, the performance aspect is, um, you know, 
there's, there's an opportunity here to ask ourselves, well, why do we do these things? Um, you know, and, and, and what are they like, I, what human need, this is like a design thinking thing is like, what, what human need are they responding to? Um, and so we get around that, you know, and we could start to think about, um, you know, Maggie and I had a, had a conversation last week about the ways in which, um, you know, Jews, I think we, we think of that, that we no longer have a pilgrimage uh, sort of practice, even though our, our, the Torah is built around it, right, is the notion of that you would travel three times a year to Jerusalem and offer your, uh, and make your offerings for um, the three uh, core holidays of uh, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And, uh, and so we don't do that. With the destruction of the temple 2,000 years ago, we don't do it. Um, and, and yet, there's, there's a, we're living through this moment where I think now we're realizing that our synagogues have become what the temple was in terms of that performative element. And the same challenge that we had 2,000 years ago is now the challenge that we've got today is how do we take this inside and, and, and construct what we call a mikdash ma'at, a small temple, a mini temple that actually has to happen in your home. Um, so I think that like, that's a challenge and that's the thing that we have some you know, a rich language around. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, and I would be so curious to know how in Islam, uh, you know, the, the, the experience and performative aspects of an actual pilgrimage tradition that's like living, like how would you incorporate that? It's not annual necessarily for most people, right? You save up, it's a once in a lifetime thing, whatever. But we had a conversation about like, you know, how, how do these like leaving and going, um, these journeying and, and, and the things that we can't, which are things that we can't do now, um, how does our experience of that, how might it inform the practices that we do have, that we have today, and how do we reinterpret them? Like that to me is a really interesting, is a really interesting intersection. Yeah, there, there are certainly um, parallels in that sense. Um, we talked about how there's a practice at the, um, during the last 10 nights of uh, Ramadan where some people will go and, and be in retreat at the mosque and it's an activity that's called itikaf that's inherently within the mosque and what does it look like to do that within one's home and um, to sort of create a mosque within one's home and, and all of that and I think that exactly what you were saying Josh about um, that we're wrestling with these same questions and the same uh, the sort of the same underlying questions behind um, all of these elements, these performative elements that are now somehow missing or, or adapting. I think that's what's been incredible uh, in seeing the conversations in this multi-faith group of over 7,000 faith leaders where, um, you know, they're all coming from very different traditions and often very different geographies as well. Um, but wrestling with this same underlying question of what does it mean to cultivate sacred presence um, for their communities when doing so physically is not always possible. Um, and, and, and that's been incredibly rich. And I think there's a way, um, you know, obviously these faith leaders are doing it from the standpoint of like, you know, they are creating um, programming and creating ritual for their communities. But I think on an individual level that that is a conversation that would be um, very helpful for, for all of us who are just wrestling with this as individuals. What does it mean um, to take the sort of performative elements of my life that I used to do in community and to do that differently? Um, and that could be really rich in terms of building those interfaith relationships. Great, great. Really helpful, helpful um, heuristics for thinking about this ways of thinking. I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat box. You can click Q&A if you have a question. We may be able to get to a couple. Two of them are pointing to the same phenomenon that the that Zoom and uh, Zoom as the stand-in for all things virtual allow us to expand communities in ways that we couldn't before. Maybe even joining communities that aren't around the corner or aren't nearby and asking about how this creates an opportunity to broaden to new participants. One of them suggests that it might even be an opportunity to reach people who have not been able to participate, whether because of uh, ability or inability, age, um, feelings of welcoming or not. Have you seen that changed at all? How do you want communities to be using technology to reach those that haven't been reached? And let's start with uh, 
but you both turned off your mutes at the same time, so I assume you both have answers. Josh, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, really great point. And, I, you know, we, uh, I, I think this, I, just as one, as one example, um, you know, our, our organization, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, we've been, you know, for 20 years, a really sort of heavily retreat-based organization, um, pilgrimage experience, right? But um, uh, going away for retreat and coming back. Um, and that, by definition, can reach only a limited number of people, right? Like, it's just, there's a high barrier to entry for that. And so what this has forced us to do is, like, figure out, well, all right, how do we like totally flip the model on its head? And, you know, we started on May, on March, March 12th, uh, we started doing a daily uh, Jewish meditation set for half an hour online. We started with 41 people um, and we grew to 350 people within a week who were doing this like for half an hour every day coming online to do, you know, basically just be quiet together um, and that in, in, in meditative silence framed by uh, some Jewish teaching. And there's really a sense of community that's now built up around it where, you know, people from all over, not just the country, but the world, right, are trying to chime in at the beginning of the chat, you know, Shalom from Buenos Aires and from, you know, Cape Town and wherever. And, um, and I think we're still getting our hands around like, well, what is the nature of that? Like, what does that mean? What is that community that's there? Like, and what, what, what's the nature of the ties? But there's no question, like we're now able to bring something to people where they could have also been meditating by themselves and been quiet, right? I mean, like, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to be quiet and introspective, but you want to do it. It turns out you want to do it in some way, like synchronously with other people. There's like this, some kind of hunger inside us that wants that and that we're meeting it. And so, um, we're now able to like take this to many more people. We're realizing, oh my goodness, we have this huge opportunity uh, to, to, to bring many more people into a practice and into a community, like actually into a community of practice. Um, and I think, I think our initial reaction, of course, is to evaluate it against what we know and say, oh, well, it can't possibly be you know, as deep or as rich. And yeah, it's not as multi-sensory. And on the other hand, um, there are things that we can do in terms of reaching people, bringing people into a relationship who otherwise wouldn't have that this is affording us the opportunity to do. So I think as time goes on, you know, we're only like 10 weeks into this, right, in a certain sense. And so a lot of us, and, um, and so as time goes on, I think we're going to get more aware of and more comfortable with embracing those opportunities and not only evaluating them against what we've known previously. Hmm. Yeah, and we'll have to watch and see how that goes. Maggie, I saw you nodding your head as I was talking about um, opportunities for people who don't usually get to participate. Um, what are you thinking? I mean, yeah, I would just add that, um, um, like for Muslims living with disabilities, for example, they often do not have um, access to programming at, at mosques or other Muslim community spaces. Um, physically or just based on a feeling of a uh, lack of inclusion. Um, so that's really opened up new possibilities, not to say that our um, Zoom and other platforms are always 100% uh, accessible um, to everyone uh, who is living with a disability, but th that has opened up, um, certainly uh, has taken down one barrier in that way. There's also an incredibly fascinating thing happening with regard to um, gender equity here. Um, where uh, we see women who are preaching and, um, you know, who may not have been considered sort of um, allowed to do that for, for, you know, leading certain, certain sermons like Friday prayers. Um, so, you know, having their voices be heard in, in new ways because it's not part of the formal rituals. So it's just a talk. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, have to be categorized that way. Um, because of the kind of childcare situation um, for a lot of parents, um, seeing uh, men have, uh, not be able to kind of go to the mosque and leave <laughs> women at home. I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, a stereotype and a generalization here, but that's something that um, for a lot of, of mothers, they've experienced where, um, you know, they, they can't go to, to the mosque to, to, to pray um, you know, during Ramadan or any other time of the year necessarily because someone has to be home with the children and all of a sudden 
men uh, are having to partake in that experience and to find spiritual benefit in caring for their children the same way that women have have found that spiritual benefit. It's it's just been really fascinating. I could go on and I and I won't because we don't have time. But um, absolutely has opened up some opportunities for some folks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we we do not have time for um, for another question, but I do want to thank both of you for joining us today. You know, if someone came in with the question, uh, does the pandemic and the challenges that we have open opportunities or only close them in Muslim-Jewish relations, this conversation makes me confident that we can open them. We have Muslims and Jews who are registered and watching. We have this conversation with you that we hope has opened up some discussions in your own mind. If you're already sitting in Muslim-Jewish relationships, take some of what you heard here back to those discussions. Um, at American Jewish Committee, we will continue to do this work, continue to seek out and build those opportunities. The moment that we are in, um, before the pandemic and certainly now with the pressures on society and the tensions that are emerging, demands that we stay at the table. Not only can't we lose ground, we have to stand our ground and push forward. As, uh, as our communities grow in this country and as hate does continue to rise, we can take action. I want us to leave with an action step. The Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, AJC, and many of our interfaith uh, and intergroup partners are advocating for the No Hate Act to improve responses and reporting to hate crimes. You can take action at ajc.org backslash take dash action, um, or just Google AJC, no hate, take action. Um, we hope that you'll join us again. Thank you. And uh, thanks to our panelists for being here and for a great conversation. Take care. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah.